Hey guys, I'm Paul. And I'm Bea. And this is Everything is Muffled. A lot of the times, there are people that find our video that are also in the non-lucrative visa process or are interested in the non-lucrative visa. So we do get a lot of questions in the comments. But I mean, obviously, like what applies to us may not apply to everybody or it may only apply to a small um, audience. So today we invited marina from bureaucracy.es and she's going to answer a lot of the frequently asked questions from her clients i'm sure you have a lot of questions right now so our interview with marina is coming up right after the interview getting a lot of questions about the process of moving to Spain and everything and our answer is always you know you should ask someone professional the experts we're not really experts so we invited someone who is an expert and we'd love to welcome Marina thanks for being here well thank you so much for inviting me so my name is Marina Inestrosa and I'm gonna help you through the Spanish bureaucracy so we know that I is, is it's a challenge to, to deal with the bureaucracy in Spain. So that's why our company called bureaucracy.es is going to accompany you from the beginning until the end. We have many clients from several countries. Most, most of them are from the UK, from the, from the US, from Canada, from Australia. But also we have clients from Taiwan, from Saudi Arabia, from Lebanon. So don't be shy and ask ask us because for sure we are going to be able to help you through this amazing journey to settle and live in Spain. So Marina, you shared with us the list of like questions that are frequently asked of bureaucracy.es. So let's talk a little bit about those common questions. Of course, the most popular question is, am I eligible for this non-lucrative visa? What are the requirements for this visa? Yes, and the first question that I'm going to make you is, where are you living? Where are you based? Because every consulate is different. So it's not the same. Well, maybe you are from the U.S. and you need to apply to the Los Angeles consulate or the Miami one. And the requirements are similar, but are not exactly the same. So I'm going to share with you the, the main requirements across the world. And the first one is about, well, you need to have a passport valid for at least 12 months. The second is the financial means. You need to have at least 28,000 euros in your VAT account uh, based on savings or passive income. Passive income is um, a pension, um, is renting out your property, um, dividends from your own company, etc. But as we know, if you are coming also with your family, these financial means are going to increase. So that's why it's important to, to know if you are coming with your partner, also with your children. And we are going to calculate how much money you need to have uh, in your bank account, uh, for example. The next one is uh, um, we need to provide a medical certificate. So you need to be healthy. And we are going to provide those, those samples. Um, the next one is the private health insurance. So we are going to provide some options. So companies uh, that are, they are approved by the Spanish authorities, and you, you are going to pick one. This private health insurance must be full coverage and no copayment, and is going to pay it out front for the next 12 months before going to the consulate. The next, the next one is going to be the, the criminal record. You have to have a clean criminal record for the last five years at least. And um, well, if you are going to come to with your family, we need to prove that you are married and um, your birth certificate of your children. So to prove that you are a family, of course, also we have uh, Spanish forms, um, the fees, etc. And we are going to help you to gather those documents and fill them out as well. Mm. So oh, this is a good one. Okay, so this is a good one. So does having a property in Spain help obtain the non-lucrative visa? Well, having a property in Spain, unfortunately, doesn't. 
because uh, this is not a golden visa. Um, you don't need to invest uh, to, to get the residency. Well, I have an additional question to that because I just watched something last night about uh, properties in Europe. Is it hard for um, people outside of Europe to acquire properties in Spain as well? It's not. No, people are ready to sell the, the property. The only, the only requirement is going to be to have the money and to have a NIE number. But anyone from any country is able to get the NIE number abroad at the Spanish consulate and all also in Spain. Wow, Very good that's, answer. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so now let's talk about uh, felonies or criminal records. Um, yeah, that's... I, I think it really needs to yeah. be asked. Uh, there have been, I, I saw one interesting one and um, something about um, they were part of some, <clears throat> they were arrested because of, um, they did some protests back in the day. <clears throat> so for good causes, but still they were, you know, they were uh -huh. arrested. Um, so can they apply? Are they still eligible for the visa? We need to understand when that happened. Because if, if it happened like uh, 13 years ago, it's going to be fine. But if it happened two years ago, we need to study the case. And in some cases, the authorities, they see that you had a felony, you have something in your criminal record, and they are going to deny it. They are going to reject the application. So we need to study the case. So sometimes it's the, the felony, the the criminal record is going to be dismissed, but we need to be careful. The, the authorities always are going to check the last five years. In some cases, you did something, just you did a mistake 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and the authorities are going to say, no, you cannot, but I, well, we can argue that and get that approval because we have done before. But yes, that's why it's important to have the free consultation. Because not always is going to be accepted. Yeah, so the, it's important that they tell you everything at that free consultation. Everything, everything, please. Let's be honest. <laughs> this is the most important thing always. So say, for example, so the non-lucrative visa, obviously, for um, a lot of it are people who are retiring or are retired and have a pension. Um but what if they have a pre-existing condition? So are they still eligible for like the private health insurance? Um, will, you know, will they have health insurance options for someone that has a pre-existing condition? As, as we know, so also we offer a free quote of, uh, in private health insurance with the best options in, in Spain. And they need to talk to the, to the company, to the health insurance company, because they need to know, they are going to know if you are going to be eligible for the private health insurance and to evaluate the pre-existing conditions. Sometimes it is, it's okay if, for example, if you have diabetes, it's going to be fine. You are going to get the private health insurance. And also if you had cancer as well, it's going to be fine. In some cases it's not. So before accepting the case, we are going to evaluate the criminal record and the medical certificate and also the private health insurance. If the company say, yes, go ahead, we can start the application as well. I see. So, so that, mm -hmm. that comes first, the criminal record, the, the medical, those are things that they need to pass. Yes, we need to get the approval from, the, from also from the health insurance company. And they, if they say, yes, it's not going to be an issue, well, we are going to cover the, this, this family, but uh, not the, the pre-existing conditions. Yes, we can start the application. Because something that is important in Spain, there is not a health insurance that is going to cover pre-existing conditions. Mm. So you, you need to pay extra for that. The rest is going to be covered for the health, by the health insurance, 100%. So to clarify a little bit about that, Marina, um, so the... Pre-existing conditions won't be covered, but um, everything else will be covered. But that's still okay. They can still go ahead with a non-lucrative visa if they get that private insurance. That's right. You're, yes, you explain it very well. So yes, if the private health insurance say yes, 
we kind of start the application. And how far back do they need to pay for the insurance? Do, can we do like monthly or how does that work? It's gonna be it's gonna be a one payment upfront for the next twelve months because the the consulate wants to check that you already paid for it, and you're not gonna quit the health insurance after living in Spain for for three months. So yes, it's gonna be one payment upfront made upfront. Okay, so one year in advance. One year in advance. Yes, right. Can they apply um, while they are in Spain as a tourist on a tourist visa? Can they apply for this non-lucrative visa? Unfortunately not. So you need to come back to your home country and apply from, from the US, from the UK, from Canada. So also, so this is important because most of the consulates, you need to go in person to the interview and gathering the documents must be in your own country. Like for example, the FBI report well, you need to share your fingerprints and it's it's going to be done in in the U, in the US. So, can they apply at the nearest consulate? Um like where like I we've heard like oh, Miami is so easy to apply in. So, can someone from California apply in Miami, for example? Uh, you can you cannot apply where you like. It's more about we need to see where you live. Where is your driver license? Uh, where, where is your address in that country? Because if you live in Nevada, you need to apply in San, at the San Francisco consulate. If you live in Florida, you are going to apply in Miami, but you cannot pick the, the best consulate for you. And there is not easy consulate, actually. So there is just rumors. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, good to know, too. <laughs> so this was... A- for me, this was my uh, biggest concern is um, since I have my own business, how do I prove that I am not working when I'm self-employed or I have my own company? How do I get to prove that? Okay, well, uh, this this is another very interesting question because we have many, many people that they are self-employed, freelance. And well, we need to address signature letter, but obviously it's not going to be possible to resign <laughs> from your own country uh, or company. So uh, I'm going to give you two examples from the UK and also from the US. Okay. And it's going to be applicable also for other countries. Uh, in the UK, we need um, a, uh, well, um, a notarized letter saying that you are going to stop working from your own company and you're not going to make well you are gonna you are not gonna have any activity on that and this company also we need a report from a british office so it's called hmcr and well you need to, you need to call them and you need to say that you are gonna stop uh, stop uh, working on your own company and they're gonna create this this report for you that I, we, after that we are gonna translate as well in the US, it's simple. It's simple. So it's just to to create a notarized letter saying, and also in both languages, saying that you are gonna stop working, and this is gonna be enough. In some cases, the tax uh, return also is accepted because, uh, well, you don't have any any activity for the last few months. Um, also, we can prove it in that way. But yes, notarized letter and also a letter from from an office or a specific office in your country. Okay. Hmm, the, that's so what we did, yeah. That's we, did what a, we did we a did letter a... of intent. <clears throat> so we, our letter of intent, we included that. Yes, that right? we're not going to work and um, we had it notarized. So, yes. um, yeah. So that was our, that was how we, because we wanted to explain ourselves better. So we had that yes. letter. Hmm. Yes, in some, in some consulate, you don't need an intention letter and some of them you need. So we are going to create also that letter for you in both languages as well. Okay. Just to go to the notary and get it notarized. So during the application process for the non-lucrative visa, do they need a real rental contract before they get to Spain? Um, like, do they need an address in Spain? I know like one of the forms asks for that. Yes, uh, you need an address in Spain. So no. In some cases, an Airbnb address is going to be enough. 
a friend's address is going to be fine as well. And in some consulates, like in Miami, they request a rental agreement for the next 12 months, uh, not a nice letter in Spain uh, of a friend that invites you to live in Spain or a cover letter saying why you pick Valencia or uh, Alicante to live. So we choose the last options. Yes, it's going to be a cover letter saying how beautiful Valencia is. And this is enough. So it's not mandatory to prove that you already rent it. And also, I suggest my client don't do it because it's better to get the approval that, as we know, it can take a few weeks or even months. And after that, uh, starting the, the rental agreement, uh, research, and all the next steps in Spain. Oh, that's okay. good. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, because we, we've seen a lot of uh, people asking that question and then we've seen different answers so it's it's i'm glad we got to settle this i'm, I'm glad that there's an alternative to just having a mm -hmm. rental contract off the bat yeah. <laughs> yes uh, uh well we are talking about the the countries like english speaking countries right now so we know that in other countries like we also we and uh, we apply in Taiwan, we apply in Saudi Arabia, in South Africa, the requirements might change and we adapt the, the application for those requirements, of course. But uh, talking about English speaking countries, applications, no, it's not mandatory to have a, a rental agreement for the next 12 months. Okay, so the, the disclaimer is that for, for most, it's not, it's not required, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. In Saudi Arabia, yes, you need to prove that you're going to live in some place. Okay. So that's why uh, uh, it's better the disclaimer, to have okay. a disclaimer. Yes, and so I think it's really important to, um, to have that consultation with you so that they know exactly what is needed from their consulate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which yes. brings, brings me to the next question. Does the pension work as proof of income? And do they need to show bank statements? Exactly. You need to prove uh, that you have that money with you. In some consulates, you need to prove the last three months of the, those bank statements. And those ones must be stamped by the bank to make them official. In some consulates, they want the, the 12 months of bank statements to prove that you already had this money. And it's not like a gift or someone lent you though, that money. In some cases, also, they want the tax return. So, for example, you have an investment plan and, and you have the money there. So you need, we need a letter to provide to prove that you are, you are able to withdraw, withdraw the money anytime at any cost, because the consulate wants to know that you, you truly can't live in Spain um, without borrowing money from, from the government. So this is the most important one. Okay. And you can combine. So this is important. You can combine your pension and also savings or just savings, just, just the pension. Sounds good. So for the pension, um, I'm assuming it's not a 28,000 or 28,000 euro requirement um, in one big lump sum, right? They can do monthly. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's going to be uh, monthly and we make a uh, justification letter, uh, well, just explaining everything in Spanish and also in English, because for the authorities, it's going to be easier to read in one letter. Well, you get three pensions, one is private to our public, and this is the, this money is in pounds, but at the equivalent, the currency in euros is this one, or the same happens with dollars, and also you have savings that are, in total is going to be 50,000 euros in your van account so or passive income uh, for the next 12 months for example so yes we make easier to easier to the authorities to to understand your finance another fascinating question that we've seen from your list is um can can i work remotely and if I have a business, should I sell it or can I keep it? Well, um, this is interesting, as we know. Uh, this visa is called non-lucrative visa. And also from the last year, it's also is called 
non-working visa. So unfortunately not. You need to prove actually that you are not going to work in Spain and you are not working in the in your home country before applying. So we need to study your case. Some people, they are retired and the pension is enough. Some people, they need a resignation letter or we need a notarized letter proving that they, they are not going to work in their company. Um, so the answer will be no. You cannot work remotely, but if you have your own company, you don't need to sell it. Of course not. You can get dividends from your company because this qualifies as passive income. Um, we are going to need a notarized letter saying that you are not going to work in the company. Just get the, the passive income. So when you say you could get dividends in your company, that means you're just getting a percentage, right? Like no no working, no communicating with uh, clients or anything like that? Uh -huh, yes, exactly. So someone is going to run the company and you are, well, the, the, uh, the company is on your name, but you are going to, you're not gonna make any activity, active activity on the company. Must be passive income always, not active one. Okay, so this also gets asked a lot. So we get this question a lot in our videos. So um, how do I pay taxes in Spain? When and how much will I pay as a resident? Oof. Yes, very, very interesting question and I'm not going to be able to answer because every single person has a different situation and we know that talking about money is a very delicate topic. So that's why we offer task, tax consultations and that are where we manage our, as a report with our, our tax advisor and they are going to help you with all this process to make feel your confidence to understand both uh, both uh, law between countries between the UK the US and Spain to make easier easier this move and also don't pay taxes in both countries so unfortunately uh, this answer can be asked in a different video okay yeah so there's yeah. no one answer for for that question no, there is not an answer for that question because every family has a different situation. But the important thing to know is that um, the process is hard mainly because of the language and the new system. So at least you guys know the system and you can speak the language for us. Like you, you guys, everyone in bureaucracy.es speaks in English, yes. correct? Yeah. Yes, we do. That's the most important uh -huh. part. <laughs> Also Catalan, Spanish and Catalan if wow. you want. So if you want to move to, to Barcelona, so yes, we are going to do it as well. And this is interesting. We are going to create a report because we know that when you see it, you read it, it's better because every single country has a different law regarding taxes. So it's going to be a report. It's not going to be a consultation in a, in a Zoom call, for example. It's going to be a report. So you're going to keep that report with you and the the answer is going to be between 48 and 70, 72 hours um we are going to give you the current situation and the next steps and also we are going to help you with the next steps as well so the, well <laughs> and now i want to ask then I, i've seen this question i think once in the group and they were saying that when I'm on an LLV in Spain, can I leave Spain? And for how long? Uh, you can leave Spain for the first for the first year, six months. But the, the reality is, if you want to obtain the permanent residency, you can leave the Spain in total only ten months. So if you leave if you leave Spain six months, the first year. The next year, you need to stay longer in Spain. So you, you need to think about it. Live in Spain, yeah, maybe making short short trips or traveling across Europe because you're not gonna get a stamp on your passport. So yes, okay. you need to consider that for the next five years. Okay. So mm -hmm. say for example, the goal is permanent residency. Um, if you divide it up, maybe just two months out of the year every year. 
right? That's right. Yeah. Or if you do the yeah. six months, then you only have four more, four months left. For... <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right for the next five years. So yeah. yes, it's better if you split that, those trips abroad. When it comes to renewal, have you heard or seen uh, denials? Like how much the odds of getting approved for renewal is it high? Is it easy to get renewed? Or have you seen cases where mm. they they got yes. denied? Yes, uh -huh. yes, it's easier to receive an, an approval because, well, as you know, you did already. We don't need a, a criminal record. We don't need that much extra documents. We need to make sure that you are gonna ha you have the money in your bank account or you have that pension. Sometimes, if you have the money abroad, we need to consider that uh, they want the money in Spain and perhaps we need to transfer the money. Some of my UK clients, they want to keep the money abroad because the currency exchange is not that well right now. Yes. So they keep the money abroad and we tell them that uh, perhaps we have to move the money within 10 days if, we, if, they, if the immigration office require, require it. So we share with our clients uh, different scenarios and different options but yes if a, if a document is issued in English we need to get the, the translation the official translation with the financial means if you got married abroad we are going to have the apostle with the official translation as well already from the last year because that's an expired the apostle and we need, we need to make sure that you have a historical empadronamiento which is a historical Padron certificate, a valid passport with all the stamp on it, uh, a private health insurance paid in advance as well, and also it's going to be the wedding certificate with a postal. So just a few documents. Of course, if you're coming with your family, you live actually with your family here. We need extra documents for the children. Okay. So how about? uh denials uh, not necessarily your clients but have you heard mm -hmm. of uh, uh particular cases or um particular reasons how people get denied for the renewal the, the money they don't they don't show enough proof of, of the money because sometimes when the authorities don't see clearly the application you have they, they are going to send you an email through the platform and you are going to see the, the reason of the requirements. They are going to requerir extra documents. Oh. And we are going to have 10 days to submit those extra documents. If we cannot accomplish, it's going to be dismissed. Okay. Oh, wow. So, so it's just 10 yeah. days. So that's why with my client is like, well, we need to prepare this just in case to, to, to make mm -hmm. sure that we have that, we accomplish that 10 days window. Mm. Okay, good to yeah, know. Good so to it know. has to be quick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it has to be real. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And well, also, we are going to pay the fees. So we are going to pay the fees. And yes, we are going to organize the documents. We create a cover letter as well. It's not mandatory, we are, but we do it. Okay. So basically, when you have children, because the children cannot apply online, so it's going to be the parents who are going to apply on their behalf. Right. Um, the father is going to apply, the mother and the children are going to apply with the father or the mother. And yes, so we do that. Yeah, that's true. I remember for the renewal, we had to submit separately as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It does, it's not just like one application for the entire family. No. Yeah. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. In some cases, well, we, with a family, uh, the, the father applied with the children documents, but... Uh, the requirement was based on the mother. So we need to submit the extra documents with the mother uh, profile, so the application. So, so there's, there's they a want few... to make sure that you're a real family and you live together <laughs> and you're very well communicated. <laughs> This person has been based in Singapore for two years and her husband has been living in Singapore for eight years now. So her husband can get the criminal record in Singapore, but for her, um, does she need to get both from Singapore and the Philippines um, or just from the Philippines? Um, but they're going to apply in Singapore, right? 
Um, interesting question as well. So many interesting questions, as as we as we know. Uh, we already mentioned this. Uh, she is uh, gonna request the criminal record from both countries. Why? Because we need to prove that at the, for the last five years, she didn't have any criminal record in those countries. She lived in the Philippines and also she is living right now in the in, in Singapore. So she is gonna request both criminal records. The husband just one because the last eight years he lived in Singapore, but as she lives, she lived in both countries. So she has to go through um, two different government agencies to do it. Yes, to the Philippines and later to to this to Singapore. So yes, she is going to submit the application with both with two criminal records and the husband just one. I had one more. Um, so what if someone like is an in a non lucrative visa, but they want to bring someone like from uh, like their domestic help um, with them to move with them to to Spain. Is that something that's possible? Well, we need to study the case as well. This is not a general answer that we can give right now. As we know, it's not a high skilled professional and the requirements are higher. And it's not going to be that easy to rent the domestic lady to Spain. So that's why it's important to to discuss this situation and evaluate if it's possible or not. All right. Whew. So I feel like like we answered a lot today. Marina, you answered a lot of our questions today. So Paul and I want to thank you for your time and your expertise. And um, well, before you go, we'd love to ask you if there's anything else that you want to say is anything else that's really important that you want to make sure that people who are watching would know. Yes, of course, where they can find us. So uh, I'm sure that uh, Paul and Bea, they are going to share with, with you guys our company. On our company, you can book a free consultation with us. You're going to see our calendar. Also, you can email us. That uh, We know that uh, having a, a talk, having a, a Zoom meeting is going to help uh, to, to discuss the, your situation and the next steps. And also, using uh, their code and uh, you're gonna get a discount as well so stay tuned and uh, check it out um, our website and also to use the discount because we are gonna be happy to assist you during this amazing journey to move to stay amazing it's an exciting journey isn't it yeah oh it's it's just so worth it and especially with your help it's probably going to be easier too so we thank you so much for your time we really appreciate you being here and and yeah and we can't wait to shoot more videos and answer more questions <laughs> well thank you so, so much for having me i'm gonna be happy to to help you and to answer any uh, future questions with you guys Thank you so much. Okay, so we hope that you learned a little bit or a lot from that interview with Marina. Don't forget to use our link, bureaucracy.es slash everything is boffo to avail of their services at a discount. I learned a lot too. And thank you so much, Marina, for being in this interview. If you like learning, you should check out these next videos. Here, here, here. And hopefully it helps. We'll see ya. Thank you. Bye.